industrial sectors. He has an additional geographic responsibility for TWA industrial members in India and uh, in supporting TWA's ambitions there. And uh, uh, prior to this uh, COVID, he has been a very regular visitor to India, very periodically. And Chris is a material scientist and has spent almost 30 years in the R&D career with a global aluminum producer. And uh, his technology areas to which he has contributed include corrosion, thermomechanical forming, plant process optimization, joining and surface treatment. He is also uh, the founder of R&DO. And with this short introduction, I invite Chris to uh, you know, introduce speaker of the day. That is also another Chris. Yeah, please. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Krishnan and, and colleagues. And um, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting day today because uh, you've just heard before Krishnan from <clears throat> a, a colleague, um, a, an ex-colleague of mine and a future colleague of mine. And we have in Chris Punchin today, um, an ex-colleague of mine and a customer of mine. And um, so I have to be really careful what I say about him <laughs> compared to maybe a year ago. It's great to be back in India again, even if it's only virtual. And, um, you know, with the jabs going, it's looking more likely that we can start coming to see you again. And I really hope we can do that after Christmas. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about Chris. Um, when I went to TWI about 14 plus years ago, welding to me was a bit kind of dirty. It had like melting things and uh, there was wires everywhere, um, kind of fumes that um, it didn't smell too bad, but I understand they didn't do me any good. And, um, and usually it was a kind of black heart and everyone had a, their own opinion on the best way of doing things. And Chris was a great introducer to me of a thing called beams. And I was really uh, pleased that he wasn't really biased between the type of beams. So he could talk to me about laser beams and electron beams. <clears throat> and he was a great interface between two technology groups at TWI who, who actually compete with each other and egg each other on in technology. So we have the laser group and we have the EB group. Uh, but essentially, uh, you know, they're, they're using beams and they're doing things called autogenous welding mainly which is also something I, I learned very much from Chris. Um, Chris has been at TWI far longer than I, and I, I'm sure he's gonna uh, relay that experience to you, but um, he also has other uh, very at good attributes. He's a, he's a great producer of local apple juice in Cambridgeshire, and uh, it's a great way to barter with my jars of honey that I get off my bees. So uh, Chris and I do trade sometimes, um, and he was really, really useful in lockdown because uh, as, as probably in India, uh, in the lockdown, everyone was trying to find innovative ways of getting a pint of beer. And um, fortunately for us, people like Chris were around and they quickly discovered the roots and the pubs which could serve through a window and they could just turn up on their bikes and take a drink and move on to the next one. So I think that could be a book coming out later from Chris. But... Um, <laughs> What we're going to learn from him today is, is something about EB and I think uh, with allusion to lasers and what we're really talking about is, is these kind of technologies. And these are actually on the increase in India, but they've always been slightly behind the curve, often due to cost, uh, due to training and to perceptions about cost. So I think with EB welding, and again, Chris will probably allude to this, um, capital equipment outlay always looks really high. Uh, the running costs tend to look a bit high. And then you've got the skills and the training. And I think what we'd like to hear from Chris today is also um, business cases. And he told me some things recently, which I was quite amazed on how quick you can get a payback on these kind of technologies. Also, there's been quite a lot of innovative um, stuff going on, which um, may uh, lead to a way of doing things outside of the vacuum chamber and, and become much more attractive to certain applications. And one of the things that Chris is going to uh, be responsible for in his new role is new energy applications. And for India and the UK, this is really important. 
Um, Shiva and I have been talking, in fact, to uh, local um, UK and India government collaborators. And, and one of the things that um, Prime Minister Modi and indeed um, Boris Johnson have agreed on is that the UK and India should be collaborating in the transition from fossils um, to green energy sources. And I, I think some of the technology you see today is going to become an enabler, uh, A, for the UK and India to collaborate further, but also um, hopefully for India to, to get on a fast track uh, in things like wind energy uh, and hydrogen and that kind of thing. So you've all seen Chris's CV. I'm sure that we'll have him back uh, again for other topics, um, but I look forward to hearing from him now um, uh, about this topic. And Chris, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the, um, the invitation and um, the the chance to present to you all. Um, I hope I hope you can see this presentation okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th thank you to you all for the kind introduction and thanks for the invitation to this this event. Um, what I'd like to do, I say this morning, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, uh, is talk a little bit about the the use of local vacuum in power beam welding for energy applications. Uh, so my background, as, as Chris said, is I spent a lot of time at TWI. I was, I was there for 38 years, and I've more recently moved to a company called Cambridge Vacuum Engineering. And I've been there for 100 days now, and I've decided in the future I'm going to change jobs every 38 years, whether I need to or not. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to... The scope of the talk today is really to explain what the the drivers are for power beam welding, um, why it's beneficial to use a local mobile vacuum system, and to touch on a few practical applications of, in the wind energy and nuclear industries. And actually, these sort of the, the if you can read across to many industries, but actually these are some specific project examples where we've been working. We'll also talk, as Chris said, about laser welding. And uh, as, as he has said, that I'm a great fan of both electron beams and laser welding processes. Um, and what I'd like to illustrate is where we are with the, the current stages of development and then um, have a summary at the end. And, uh, and what I'd certainly encourage is people to, to ask questions via the chat and Q&A system. And please feel free to contact me uh, in person at any time. So just as to um, illustrate the, the drivers for power beam welding, the, what you see on the left-hand side is a, a multi-pass submerged art weld. This is a, a low heat input submerged art welding process. And what you see is we have to make a, a double-sided V preparation, and then we replace the material that's gone with a, a flux shielded wire deposition. And if you very quickly count these passes, you see the 70, 70 well passes in this joint. Uh, you also have to preheat the material before you weld. And there's, if you make a defect buried in the middle here, you have to excavate quite a large amount to repair it. So in contrast, the electron beam process produces a weld in a single pass. So this is 100 millimeter thick, low alloy steel. It produces a, a single pass weld, which is actually parallel sided. And this gives you some benefit also in terms of distortion, shrinkage and residual stresses. Whereas this does give some out of plane bending uh, stresses, which cause uh, deformation. This is a, a, a laser weld made at atmospheric pressure with probably the, the um, the more most powerful commercially available lasers. You can, you can penetrate a lot more than this with a 100 kilowatt laser, but they're very rare and uh, not really commercialized. What you'll see though, is this is made at atmospheric pressure and you'll see later in the presentation, the benefit we can gain by operating the laser process in a vacuum at, uh, at reduced pressure. So as, as you can hear globally at the moment, there's, there's a big driver towards renewable energy. 
and in particular in the UK, which is a very a very windy part of the world. In fact, it's probably one of the most windiest parts of the world. Uh, offshore wind is a big uh, driver for decarbonisation of industry, decarbonisation of electricity production, and also for things like hydrogen manufacture for producing green hydrogen. The UK is quite fortunate in the sea around Britain is quite shallow. Uh, but if you go off the west coast of Britain into the Atlantic, the sea's a lot deeper. So the type of foundation for an offshore wind structure depends on the water depth and the sea, the sea conditions. The other thing about the UK is the sea is very rough, <laughs> if you've ever been on a ferry. So there's a thing called a gravity base, or a mo- and this is a monopile foundation. So this is a steel tube driven into the ground and then is protected by... Uh, uh, anti-scouring rocks. This is a, a jacket foundation. This is called a twisted pile. And these are floating, floating foundations where the sea, where the sea is very, very deep. Uh, so we're going to concentrate on this monopile foundation. There's a thing you can't see off the picture called a gravity base, which is a, a heavy concrete base that just sits on the, the seabed. So this pile is driven into the seabed and then is protected by this scour protection. And these, these are growing in size and uh, dimensions all, all the time. So now this picture was taken. These were three megawatt wind turbines. The, um, the most recent development is a 16 megawatt wind turbine. And just to illustrate that one revolution of the turbine is enough to power a Tesla car for 380 miles. So it shows the, uh, the benefit. So one thing that people have always worried about is we talk about electron beam and laser welding vacuum. And that, to some people, sort of infers complication and complexity. But actually, it's it's a really good welding atmosphere because it prevents oxidation of reactive or, or actually any metals. And prevention of oxidation is generally achieved by using a gas or flux shielding. So in, immediately, you don't need any gas or flux shielding. Uh, you also actually vacuum remelt the weld metal. So one of the ways you refine materials is you vacuum remelt them. So when you weld in a vacuum, you, you refine the material in terms of removing impurities. Uh, there's, there's no plasma effects that, like you get in atmospheric um, laser or electron beam welding. It's actually very easy to generate a vacuum and it's quite low cost. You only have to buy electricity and the electricity produced by renewable energy sources is, is also a benefit. It also gives you some controls. It means that the component is, is the, the atmosphere is controlled. So we know what the atmosphere is. So if you're welding an alloy like titanium or aluminium, you, you know that the um, oxidation is prevented because you have a vacuum. It also prevents fume. As Chris mentioned the toxicity of some welding fumes now. All the fume is collected and uh, there is no operator uh, issue. And you don't get any convection as you do with art welding processes where the shielding gas can be blown away. And also what you, what you end up is a very well contained process. And actually you only need to go 60 miles from here to get a perfect welding atmosphere. But unfortunately that's in space. So, um, this is a lady Russian cosmonaut electron beam welding a bit of the space station. So this process is already used in space. And actually, it's a really good idea if you're doing off-planet fabrication to use uh, electron beam welding. So the problem up until now has been that if you want to weld a large component, you have to build a large chamber to put the component inside. This is um, 230 cubic meter chamber at um, Canim in the south of France. And they're welding a, a big tubular component. The, the reason they want to do it in a vacuum with the electron beam is because of the dimensional accuracy they want to achieve and the material type. This is a, a, a difficult alloy to weld, an alloy steel, which is difficult to weld. Uh, the problem is it has to fit inside the chamber. So if you want to make a bigger one, but join two together, the chamber is not big enough. So the, the drivers for local vacuum is, are the requirements to weld very big components uh, where the, the benefits of high productivity welding are, are most uh, prominent. 
So in this case, this is a monopile foundation. These are, these are the people, and you can see this is made out of several three meter wide steel plates, which are rolled and welded. So each of those white lines is where the magnetic particle inspection is being carried out. And that re represents a weld. So that's a longitudinal weld and then two circumferential welds. And again, this is designed for a 3.6 megawatt turbine, whereas now with a that's a small turbine and they're typically up to 10, 10 megawatts or more. So the foundations have got bigger. This is an oil and gas production spa which it would be very impractical to put inside a vacuum chamber. And similarly, this is a uh, chrome molly pressure vessel. These are the people. And you can imagine a vacuum chamber to encompass this would be impractical and, and costly, and also would take a long time to evacuate and thereby you'd eliminate any economic and productivity advantage. So local vacuum is, is something we've been looking at at Teed for a long time. Uh, this is in 2009, just to give you a time print. And uh, this was the early prototype local vacuum head. So basically, this is a 45 millimeter thick duplex stainless steel plate. And the local mobile head, which is the electron, electron beams coming out of here. And a very simple sealing arrangement gives you a vacuum while you're translating along the work beam. And you'll see the, um, the pressure, although we call it a vacuum, it's not a fantastic vacuum, it's about one millibar. And here we have, um, <coughs> excuse me, some quite rudimentary seal. These are brushes with a um, uh, elastomeric outer seal. You see the well bead here. Uh, so, so the idea is that you put this head on the end of your electron gun, and then you can carry out welding with a local vacuum with the workpiece in air at atmospheric pressure. And you can have different geometry systems and components. And these are, these are artists' schematics, obviously. And um, there's, there's many different ways in which this can be applied. So for the, for the offshore wind foundation, so these, this is a, a much bigger foundation than we, one we showed earlier. This is 11 meters diameter. It weighs about 1,200 tonnes and is 60 metres long. Uh, this is courtesy of EEW in Germany. And again, these are manufactured by rolling cans, making long seams and then circ seams. One of the very critical areas is where you attach the, the tower attachment flange uh, by means of a, a weld, full penetration weld. Typically, this is over 100 millimetres in thickness, so 100 millimetres full penetration wells all the way along. And, and productivity is a real key to success in, in the economics of offshore wind. So this is driven into the ground. This is the monopile, this is the monopile. And then you um, bolt on a transition piece or you grout on the transition piece and then bolt on the tower on top of the transition piece. There's many different designs, uh, but the key to it is that you have to make these quickly to make the best advantage of the, the wind farm leases. And typically they're looking at making one or two of these structures a week. Um, again, the way, the way they're produced is that you roll a can, and this looks quite thin, but this is actually 80 to 100 millimeters thick. They can be up to 125. And then, then you carry out, in this case, long seam welding with uh, multi-wire submerged art welding. And, and these are the productivity issues that you have to be able to do this quickly enough to, to get the production rate you need. And this is a typical um, lay down for a, an offshore wind farm. These are the transition pieces. So you can see the size of the structures. And these are the monopiles that this uh, transition piece slots over the top of. The piles are then driven into the seabed and the, the transition piece is grouted onto the outside. So the, the idea of using local vacuum electron beam for this was, was uh, put forward. So we built a prototype welding head. This is for a slightly smaller diameter component. And again, you can see there's stainless steel brushes and an elastomeric seal. So it's not, it's not what you call sophisticated vacuum engineering. And the, the first um, trials were carried out with this prototype system, prototype head. 
And uh, this is a 2.3 meter diameter can. And the aim was to demonstrate how quickly we could make a, a weld seam in, the, in a long, longitudinal uh, component. And the, the conclusion was that we could, this is 1.7 meters long. So it's only a short component. And we found that it would take from beam on to beam off six minutes, uh, actually from system on to system off in six minutes. So it pumps very, very quickly because of these, um, the number of pumps we have. And on the back, we have a little backing vacuum with a tiny vacuum pump that keeps the vacuum at the back of the joint. And we don't use any preheats and there's no wire or flux or gas as a, as a shielding. So there's no consumables apart from electricity. And here you see the well profile. This is 60 millimeters thick and it's an S355 grade uh, carbon manganese steel. What you see is the well cap and roots. Are, they're not, not, not ideal, but these can be readily dressed or uh, ground flush if you need to. And um, oops, the same picture. And what you see is the well cap is just a little bit spattery. And again, you, you could might have to grind that to uh, to improve it. But over the years that we've we've got better at it, and the well beads are, are better. What you also notice is there's very little in the way of cleaning. This has still got the oxide scale from the rolling process on, so we don't do a lot of cleaning. And that's by virtue of the fact that the, the pressure we're working at is several times higher than traditional electron beam welding. So several orders of magnitude higher. Um, another benefit is that if you increase the thickness of your component to 80 millimeters from 60, the welding process time is exactly the same. You just use more power and weld at the same speed. So we, we then um, looked at the, the idea of commercializing this as, as a method and had to, had to go through a series of um, uh, discussions with, with the fabricators and the end users, and then to decide what was the definition of success for, for this new process. And what we had to do is show it was reliable, it produced uh, accurate wells uh, at the, the required productivity rate, and demonstrated the, the economics in terms of the joint completion and the absence of con consumables. What we also found was that the energy consumption of the process is significantly less than alternative um, multi-pass multi arc welding processes, particularly by the elimination of preheat. That's a, that's a big bonus. Uh, we had to show that weld properties were acceptable in terms of fracture and fatigue. And the key to all of these weld process introductions is convincing the regulator that they can put it in their, that their, their, their standard, their specification and say this process is is fit for service and and uh, adequate um, one of the things that happens with the electron beams when they hit metal targets they generate x-rays so the the only the only real real concern for the adoption of the process in industry was showing that the x-ray enclosures were safe and the um, process doesn't produce any well fumes it doesn't produce much heat you can put your hand on the weld after you've finished welding and you don't have to de-slag, you don't have to chip slag off, which is another a risk in a factory. Um, so then we, we looked at the potential for industrial exploitation and, and set up a, a project with Scottish and Southern Energy in the UK to demonstrate the process and get it into production with qualification from DNV GL, who are now just DNV. Um, in a, in a similar project, we've, we've looked at making circumferential steels in austenitic stainless steel, again, using our, our prototype welding head and looked at options for X-ray enclosures. So this is for making circ seams on, on long tubular structures. And again, a, an artist's impression of, of what the system could look like. So we, just as a demonstration, again, we got a 316L austenitic stainless steel, 60 millimeter wall thickness tubular structure and welded it using the local vacuum system. The, the, the big takeaway is it only takes 27 minutes from start to finish, but the, the big advantage is in terms of distortion. So we measured the shrinkage in length 
which was 0 0.5 millimeters. And we measured the shrinkage in diameter, which was less than one millimeter. So that gives you a, a, an impression of, of the distortion characteristics. Uh, we also radiographed the weld and it was um, acceptable to the ASME code, no, no indications. And again, you can use immediate inspection. It's cold enough to inspect when you've finished. This is a macro section through the weld, which shows the, the weld quality. And the, the fairly agricultural welding head. So this is a vacuum system, which doesn't really look like a vacuum system, but it's a, it's a consequence of the pressure that we work at. Uh, so based on the success of these two projects, uh, Cambridge Vacuum Engineering set about to commercialize the product. So this is a, a value engineered vacuum system for making longitudinal seams. And now you can see the electron gun is, is, is properly engineered and it's made for maintainability and consistency and reliability. And it's a, a big step forward from the prototype that we built in 20, 2009. And this shows the, the entire linear seam welding uh, device. So this, uh, this will weld up to 4.2 meters in, in, in width or length. Uh, what you also notice is we painted the inside of the, uh, the system shield white. And you'd say, what's the best color to paint a welding system? You wouldn't say it was white because they get dirty very quickly. But what this illustrates is this is still looks the same even after many years of operation. And it's because all the welding fume goes down these pipes into the pump and is trapped by the oil, which is filtered. And then you simply uh, clean the filters or dispose of them. So as a, as a welding environment, it's really, really quite pleasant. There's no preheat. It's a nice white room and there's no fume. And this, this shows the X-ray enclosure. So, so this is just a box. This is not a vacuum chamber. It's just there to contain the, pro the x-rays produced in the process. So you see, as soon as the weld is finished, the green light comes on and you can open the doors and um, you, you see the system inside. Uh, the, let me just move that a little faster. And what you see is the, the electron gun slides along this, this uh, engineered seal. So this gives you the, the motion, but maintaining a vacuum at the same time. And the, um, the, to start the weld process, you simply close the door and press start. And in, um, in, in the new digital revolution, you could probably do this from the, the comfort of your own kitchen. You don't need to be there to do it. You can just press the green button remotely. Uh, so so this, this shows the process has now been commercialized and Cambridge Vacuum Engineering sell these systems. And what they've done is, is made everything a lot more clinical and better engineered. So this is a sliding seal. This is a local vacuum sliding seal with a radius head. You can make a new head for a different diameter very quickly and very cheaply. This is the, the linear seam, which we've just showed you in the box. This is a linear seam welder. And this is the sliding vacuum seal, which has now been, been re-engineered uh, by CVE. So, so what you see now is a, a much more um, rigorous, well-engineered structure for, for long seam welding. This is the welding head. That's the weld bead emerging out of the, the last seal. Um, so you see it's all, it's all very controlled and, and clinical. And what we've, what we've since done is a, a three meter long uh, monopile foundation demonstrator. In this case, it's three meters long. It's a pin pile for a, for a jacket. Uh, it's in S355 got manganese steel. Excuse me. And um, the welding time is is about 10 minutes. So again, this is with with no wire, no flux, and no preheat. So apologies for people who sell welding consumables, but this might not be very attractive to them. Uh, uh, so so what we've since done is is gone through a process for qualifying the weld procedure and um, to to gain approval from the the, the regulator. So these are test panels that we've welded and these have sub been subjected to some quite serious mechanical testing campaign and at the at the time of um talking now that we have a an approval for linear seam welding from uh, from the regulator this is a, a another illustration of the benefit of not adding a welding consumable 
So what you see here, this is, uh, this is about 125 millimeter thickness. Um, this is the weld metal you see and the heat affected zone. This is in the as welded condition. Uh, but if you carry out a full normalizing heat treatment after welding, the weld it becomes invisible. And the reason for that is this is the weld metal here. You get a very fine grained ferritic microstructure with uh, distributed perlite. In the parent metal, you get banding and a lot more inclusions. So one of the benefits of welding with this process is the inclusion number reduces and the size of inclusion reduce. So that's a benefit. In fact, in this case, if you normalize the weld properties are better than the parent metal properties. So, uh, so one suggestion is you could make everything out of EB weld metal. That's a, not, a, not, not a serious suggestion. Uh, so move, moving forwards, the, one of the, the issues you can probably see is that you have to put the component in a uh, X-ray shield to prevent the operators from um, any ionizing radiation, protect them from ionizing radiation. What um, the engineers at CBE have done now is produced a system with a local X-ray shield, which means the operators can sit here quite happily if they need to be there, they don't actually need to be there anymore because it's a digital process and they can carry out these long seams without um, a, a big chamber. So it means you can put in very big structures uh, into, the, into the system. So um, here you see the localized shields just around the corner here. So, so in this case, what we're looking at now is eight meter diameter monopile foundations and in, uh, in the next few weeks, we're starting production. So this is now a production welding system. And the first few of these um, welded structures will be installed into the North Sea in um, the earliest part of next year. Oh. My picture's gone. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. To, so, so, so just to illustrate this, that. Well, one of the other me methods for eliminating the need for X-ray shielding is that instead of using an electron beam, uh, we use a laser beam. And what you can't see in this picture is a local vacuum laser welding setup. Uh, I'll, show, I'll show you at the end, which, which allows you to weld um, both atmospheric pressure, but at a very coarse vacuum. And what we've discovered is that if you weld at this pressure, you double the penetration of your laser weld. So with, with a, a 10 kilo, a five kilowatt laser, we were welding about 10, 12 millimeters. By going to this pressure, you double that to about 25, 20 to 25. And with, it, with the added benefit of, you don't need any plasma suppression gas, and with the additional benefit is there's no well porosity or cracking. Um, so moving on to another project, uh, looking at local vacuum, in this case, electron beam welding, but equally could have been applicable to the laser process, is to make what's called a, so you battery have a, a nuclear reactor design that produces four megawatts of electricity. So that doesn't sound like very much, but for a, a remote community or a town or a hospital, this would be, be a real, um, uh, real benefit. So in places like Canada, where they have remote populations, having a, a reactor that you only need to refuel every 18 months is, is a great bonus compared to what they currently do is helicopter diesel <laughs> uh, into the, the remote communities. And this, this shows the the first uh, stab at a design for this reactor. It's a high temperature helium cooled reactor. And um, what we aim to show is that using local vacuum electron beam welding, we could produce this component. And basically it's a, it's a pressure vessel with a, a flange at one end and a, a dished end at the other. And this was to be produced in 304H grade austenitic stainless steel with a wall thickness of 60 millimeters. And part of the requirement was that we would weld uh, linear seams, so 2G position, horizontal, vertical, as well as making circumferential seams in the vertical up or 3G position. And the aim was to qualify these weld procedures to the 
requirements of ASME Section 9, but also to qualify the machine and the personnel. And this is a father and son team uh, who are qualified welders at the shipyard and um, would put themselves forward to be qualified for electron beam welding. And, and because this was going to be carried out in an industrial environment, that um, the, the, the requirements of uh, the cleanliness levels and the environment on the well process reliability were, were key to um, the, the demonstration. So what you see is we see some water on the floor here. This is on a, on a dry day. So the shipyard, the roof leaked a bit. This roof was leaky. And you can see the conditions are not the same as our nice uh, shiny workshop. So the aim was to show that you could use this process in a real industrial environment without any um, implications on terms of quality or, or properties. Um, so this is shown as setting the parts up. Um, again, the linear seam was welded with a local vacuum head, and this is uh, 60 millimetres thickness, 1.5 metres long, and the welding time for completion is eight, eight minutes, and there's no wire, flux or gas shielding required. So, so the economics are, are quite strong. This is the first can welded. Um, I think I might have put a bit of weight on during lockdown. Um, and so, so what you see is we, we carried out a, a spot, a local tack weld, a, a continuous tack weld, and then a, a, um, a conti continuous circumferential weld. And the end result is a, a fully welded and inspected pressure vessel produced in minimal time in a shipyard where the roof leaked and the pigeons weren't, uh, there were a lot of pigeons and the combination of pigeons and rain coming through the roof made it quite an interesting environment during lockdown. <laughs> so you see the parts, these are the parts uh, arriving on the lorry. Uh, one of the big concerns at the start of the project was could we get the fit up that we required? And our target was, was about a millimeter. And, and what we found is we could readily achieve this 0.2 millimeter gap. And what you notice also, it's a very dirty feeler gauge, which I was a bit unhappy about but it made no, no difference to the weld, the weld quality. Um, the fit wasn't perfect to start with, but with a bit of adjusting, you can, you can improve it. In fact, we started off with a 40 millimeter gap and managed to squeeze it up to 0 0.2. Um, this is the our nice white shiny X-ray shield and the electron gun and the, the, uh, the beam power test. So this is the shipyard. You see, um, this is the dished end. We're trying to keep it dry, but <laughs> um, what you can't see is the pigeons, but they are there, I promise you. And actually one of the tests we have when we're choosing a site for EB welding is if you drop your sandwich on the floor, uh, would you eat it? And in this situation, um, the sandwich never got to the floor because the pigeons got it first. <laughs> Um, so, so here's uh, an example of, of the setup. This is so we seal the, the joint with just a piece of self adhesive tape, which normally in a in a high vacuum system you would never uh, get away with. Um, this is the carbon steel uh, run on run off tab. Uh, we use a, a circular beam oscillation to increase the effective diameter of the beam, but also to put a witness as to where the the, the weld is. And that leaves a mark on the surface. So when we go to inspect the weld, we have a, a target to say the weld line is right in the middle of that, that circle. Then uh, we do a shop tool ultrasonic inspection. Um, you can see looking at a, a phased array system. And then um, we invited a, a surveyor from Lloyd's Register to check that we carried out the welding procedure according to the parameters we put on our um, WPS. And he uh, agreed we'd done it properly and then he stamped it with his stamp. So um, the, this is where we manufactured the parts initially and then we machined them to, to put in some, some extra insert pieces for, 
Uh, this is machining the end preps on a vertical borer. And um, so you can see, so this is the problem here that the, due to COVID, the operator had to go off sick and the maintenance man for the machine went off sick. So that left us with a bit of a delay. Uh, so after circumferential welding, the, we carried out uh, time of flight, ultrasonic testing, and we then um, had to develop some systems for uh, starting and stopping the weld, which, which worked quite well. <clears throat> so again, here you see for the circ welding, we have it in our, our white chamber, which is still white inside. And here you see the dished end and the, the flange connection. And at the end of it, we had a qualified uh, father operator and son operator uh, with the son standing on a piece of wood so he can look taller than his father. Um, and here's the, the happy team that finished the, uh, the first component. And there's a lot more people involved than you see here, but uh, this is just at the end of the, the programme. So the... The great conclusion was that, that everything had gone really well and that the, the process could be qualified, the operators could be qualified, but also we found a few things in the ASME section nine code, which we'd like to change. So, so we're in the process of talking to the ASME code body and trying to, um, if you like, get the process included a bit more rigorously. It is included, so you can use local vacuum electron beam, but there's a few of these parameters we'd, we'd like to change. So we're in the process of that. Um, just very quickly moving on that um, we're able to weld much thicker material than 80 millimeters. So here's 140 millimeters in A508 uh, class three steel for reactor pressure vessels. And now we're up to 200 millimeters. So this is a single pass weld with no um, no filler metal and no preheat. So we're still um, moving forwards with that. And the idea is to weld, weld big vessels with a, a local vacuum system, which we're, we're currently developing. Um, so the next steps are uh, commercially testing the system in, in other environments. Uh, the environmental conditions, we've, we've kind of shown we can work in a, a, a wet shipyard and we still looking for other codes that we have to meet. So we'd be pretty confident that we can meet the code requirements, but we have to demonstrate code compliance for things like preheats, for things like statutory delay for inspection. And um, we're always looking for new opportunities for industrial exploitation. And um, so what you see, this is, this is me in 1986 when I used to have hair and uh, in the process has been around a long time and we've been welding thick material for a long time. But the, the big step now is to go towards um, uh, local vacuum for, for big structures in, in quite serious environmental conditions. So we're looking for things like hydrogen, um, ammonia production, pressure vessels generally. Offshore wind is, is a real um, clear avenue for us. Uh, but also the nuclear pressure vessels and nuclear waste storage is somewhere this process uh, has got some good applications. So um, I'd just like to stop there and, and perhaps ask you for any questions. I, I see there are things in the chat and Q&A which I haven't read yet, so I'll, I'll have a quick look and I'll pass you back to um, uh, our, our chair, our chairman and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That's, uh, that was really clear and precise. I've got one question for you. Mine's the last one on your chat. Um, uh, excuse me if you've already told us, but are there standard welding procedures for specific end uses or are these being developed? Um, what I mean is, will there one day be a kind of handbook for it um, or do you do things case by case? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we do things case by case. Uh, but I, I think what we're doing now is amassing a, a, a lot of welding parameters and conditions for certain materials and thicknesses. So, so I think we will produce a compendium. And uh, we're about to begin a project which will address all of the different pressure vessel codes. And what we're aiming to do is use that project to generate data uh, 
and well procedures. Because <clears throat> at the moment, it's very hard to convince a regulatory code without any data. If you, if, um, if you go to the code and says, you know, Chris said it'll be all right, that isn't sufficient, apparently. Yeah, Chris, uh, this is Krishan here. Uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. So any uh, applications in the pressure vessel industry so far? Um, so in the in the pressure vessel industry, with the, the one we've showed you is for the U-battery pressure vessel. Oh, uh, okay. But we, we're also looking at, um, at many others. So 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 what, what we're doing is looking at things like chrome chrome moly steels. Uh, okay. We're looking at um, nine percent nickel hydrogen storage tanks. We're looking okay. at uh, uh, we've done some welding tests on two chrome moly vanadium oh. in uh, in thick section fairly thick sections, one hundred and fifty millimeters so far. And we've done work on chrome moly vanadium and three percent nickel steels and three oh, percent. Yeah, that yeah. would be great. We've also been looking at duplex stainless steel. We're looking at um, ferritic stainless steels and dissimilar metal combinations. That's another area which is quite interesting. Oh. So, um, yeah. yeah. But the short answer is we, we'd like to do more real pressure vessel demonstrations. And uh, okay. we'd be very happy if anybody had would like to contact us and say, Right. Any well our pressure vessel. <laughs> oh. So I think uh, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Yeah. First, uh, a quick question. Um, you were showing the um, uh, laser welding uh, vacuum machine. So yeah. That in uh, missing. Uh, regarding that, um, you also mentioned uh, porosity and cracking issues could be resolved using this uh, particular machine. Would this apply for uh, special alloys uh, Specifically, uh, materials like aluminium 6000, 7000 series or aerospace grade uh, titanium, where uh, porosity and cracking is a general issue. Yeah, I, I, the experience, unfortunately, that my, my pictures didn't show it very well because the pictures didn't appear. But the what, one of the things we've shown is that if you weld laser welding vacuum, the when you laser weld at atmospheric pressure, you need to use a plasma suppression gas to blow away the plasma to get the penetration to work. And one of the sources of porosity in laser wells is entrapment of plasma suppression gas. And the, the other benefit of welding in vacuum with a laser is by definition, the boiling point of the liquid metal um, is associated with the, the vapor pressure uh, or the, pre the, the external pressure of the environment. So if you go, if you go down in pressure, it means the, the material boils at a much lower temperature. And um, that means that you end up with, first of all, no, no plasma to suppress, but also a much more efficient process and a more stable welding capillary. So the consequence of that is you, you, you don't get so much cracking because the weld shape's better and you don't get porosity because you don't have any plasma suppression gas. And certainly the, the vacuum level we're working at is is good enough for certainly more than good enough for oxidation prevention, even in titanium alloys. Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps you could try if we are, you come out of the uh, uh, the presentation mode from the slides. Oh, sorry. The uh, okay, hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the... Um, Yeah, I think you are out of the presentation mode now. Okay, so yeah. So can we take the Q and A? Um, if I if I just if I could just very quickly share my screen again. Yeah. Um, so can you see that? Yeah, it's visible now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's, uh, so so what this shows is the effect of pressure on laser weld depth. And basically, at 10 to the 3 hectopascals, which is the same as millibar, uh, with 9 kilowatts, we get 10 millimeter penetration. 
if you go 10 to the zero, which is one millibar, we get double, double the penetration depth. And many, many people have shown a similar thing. So they show the effect of working at atmospheric pressure. And then you go to, um, this is atmospheric pressure. And this is a, a very coarse vacuum. So you get a lot more penetration for your money. And the reason is that you at atmospheric pressure, you get this plasma plume and that absorbs laser energy and scatters the beam a bit. If you go to, to uh, 10 millibar, you still got a tiny bit of plasma left. If you go to 10 to the minus one, it disappears. It's all gone. And, and that's why you get extra penetration. So, so we tested it with a five kilowatt fiber laser with our very rudimentary 2009 welding head. And what you saw then, you got a centerline crack. This is atmospheric pressure. Yeah, centerline crack and a wide weld, which is why it cracks. But if you go to 50 millibar, you get this double penetration, very nice weld. And most people would struggle to see that's a laser weld rather than the electron beam weld. And at uh, Arkham University, they've now gone up to, um, this is 40 millimeters thickness. And more recent, if you, if you turn, this is in PA position, downhand. If you turn that through 90 degrees, go PC position, you get another 20 millimeters of penetration. So this is a well cap in PC in about 50 millimeters thick material, full penetration. So I think you'll see the laser wells are, are actually moving on quite quickly. And you get these additional benefits of low porosity, no process gas and no you don't need a laser cell because the local vacuum head provides the laser shielding. Okay, yeah, sorry, that was, should have been in the original presentation. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, can I now read the questions which you can take up? Yeah, so should I go to the chat or Q&A? Yeah, it is in the Q&A. Q&A. Um, yeah. So can you, can you please share the mechanical testing results and type of testing? Um, what, what I can do is if, if, you, if you'd like to send me um, your email address, what I'll do is I'll send you what data I'm allowed to. Uh, but, but we have got a lot of data, and it's really about what, what particular results you'd like to know about. Um, some of it's confidential at the moment, but hopefully once, once we get some approval, we can share that a bit more widely. But there is, there is a lot of stuff which I can pass on to you. Um, so the this e, so the next question is is EBW approved in ASME section nine, and ASME section eight, division one. Uh, I think the short answer is yes, and we're currently in discussion with ASME section nine and eight and three to just go through some of the fine details to to get it up to date with um, sort of modern technology. So yes, I think it is approved, um, and you can approve a well procedure with ASME section nine. Uh, does the capping well seem required filler? Uh, no, you, you, you tend to get a reinforcement anyway, um, but you, you can add filler wire to the weld if you want to. We prefer not to because it's an additional complexity, but um, you can add filler, but it doesn't need it necessarily. Um, so the phase array UT, the question is the NDT, was the phased array UT a pass? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, passed that phased array UT and toft. Uh, can we use the next question is can we use it for less thick components? Absolutely. You can weld you can weld a millimeter thick with it if you want to, but the question is, is there a benefit? So you need an economic benefit to make it worthwhile. And actually you could weld happily six millimeter thick steel with GMAW at the same sort of productivity. So the benefits are if you weld thick material or if you want very low distortion uh, on thin material, on thinner material. So yeah, we can, you can weld anything from one millimeter to 250 with the same system. Oh, okay. Uh, so somebody's asked is this, as there's no heat generated, how does the metal melt? Uh, the, there is heat generated, but it's very local to the weld joint. So in fact, the, the process temperature in the middle of the keyhole is about 5,000 degrees, but it's very localized so that the, the melting you get is local to the joint. 
there is heat generated, but it very quickly dissipates, which is why you can put your hand on it after welding. Um, uh, Mohammed Rahil's asked, was hardness testing performed? Uh, and if yes, what was the reading? So on the carbon manganese steel, all of the wells were less than 248 Bickers hardness, and typically about 220 in carbon manganese steel. But it is very steel dependent. And um, so far, we've, we've always managed to keep the, uh, the hardness below the, the maximum required. Uh, so another person's asked, Krishnan's asked about local vacuum sealing. Is it custom built uh, for, for the linear welding circular system? Are they interchangeable? So um, the, the answer to that is uh, for above three meters diameter, you don't need any curvature to the head. So it's, it's effectively a flat head. Below three meters, you, you want to make a head which is bespoke for the thickness within reason um, but that's a very simple piece of machined aluminium it's, it's not a difficult component to make and in fact you've got a if you've got a CAD drawing and a CNC system you can make one very cheaply and and those bits are just like spaces for the for the weld seals the um, question is are, is there any limitation on material thickness uh, the answer is within that range one millimeter to 250. Depends what the material is, of course. If it's tungsten, you can't do 250 millimeters. Uh, and, and like I say, if you've got um, an application, please feel free to email it to us. Um, I think you probably have the email address from the invitation already. Um, somebody's asked what, what will be the cost of pressure vessels of 50 millimeters thick? Uh, so I'm not quite sure if the, if the question is about the cost of the machine or the cost of the weld process. The weld process, once you've, um, once you've installed the equipment, uh, very quickly is, is very low cost. So one thing Chris mentioned was about the payback time on a system. And in the offshore wind monopile calculations we did, it showed a payback time of about seven weeks. So the cost of the equipment would be um, recovered after seven weeks of welding by the savings in energy consumables and uh, the throughput that you could achieve. Uh, so Yogesh has asked, what is the cost implication compared to regular welding processes used in pressure vessel and piping manufacturing? Uh, again, it's very, very much dependent on how many parts you want to make and uh, what, the th what the throughput is. The, the biggest cost benefits come from high productivity of the same geometry and size of components. But if you're worried about welding distortion, you can achieve a lot of um, uh, cost reduction by uh, removal of recovery requirements. So actually, the cost implications are very complicated to work out and depends how you measure your costs as well. So again, if, if you've got any a specific pressure vessel in mind, if you want to send us an email, what, what we can do is, is give you a few indicators of, of uh, typical costs. It depends on welding. If, you, if you're welding titanium uh, or welding a nickel alloy, sometimes the consumable costs are very high. With electron beam, there is no consumable cost apart from electricity. So very much depends on how you calculate your um, costs for conventional welding. Well, one of the, the big benefits is, is you minimize the amount of work in hand because you, you, get, you get through it quicker. And the uh, final question in the Q&A is, um, is PWHT required? That in, in the, uh, the nuclear pressure vessels, PWHT is required by the code. So you have to heat treat um, uh, those materials to achieve the required properties. So, so for any pressure vessel in chrome moly steel or uh, manganese moly steel, you have to do post weld heat treatment. For the monopile foundation uh, example, there is no pre no post heat necessary. Um, and despite the code suggesting that it is, I don't think anybody's ever heat treated a monopile. <laughs> So 
uh, we, we are talking to the code about that as well, but as it stands that they'll be used in the as welded condition. So this requires some preheat or even preheat is not required? No, so we, we never use preheat and it's it's a difficulty in convincing the regulatory bodies. Ah, okay, okay. So, so one, of, one of our missions is to convince them that we don't need to use preheat and for that you need data. <laughs> yeah, uh, but actually, in, you, yeah, if you look at ASME, in, ASME preheat is not mandatory. It's right. just mandatory. It's just mandatory that you use preheat if you qualify. You yeah, because everything uh, here depends on the carbon equivalent. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a difficult concept to, to take on, but even welding 200 millimeter thick manganese yeah. molly steel, we, we don't preheat it. Oh, okay. And it never cracks. <laughs> even... <laughs> never, say, never say never, they always say. But... So, it's, so again, what, what we're trying to do is generate data to, to give that um, level of acceptance and ah, okay, okay. so if if you go to the regulator and say we don't need to preheat it they say are you sure <laughs> so what <laughs> so what we need is data and that's why we'd like to engage with people like yourselves in welding different steels in different requirements with um, and generate property data so the um, microstructure of the weld and heater plate zone is more or less similar to the arc welding or it's much finer? Um, so it, it very, very steel dependent, but, but basically the heat affected zone is very similar to high heat, high heat inputs, high heat. <coughs> welding. Uh, the weld metal depends on what the composition of the steel is. So one of the benefits of arc welding is you have multi-passes to refine the microstructure. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things you do in submerged art welding is add oxygen to the weld and right. you end up with an aluminium to oxygen ratio, which promotes a circular ferrite, which is good. Um, so the electron beam process doesn't do that. And actually, if you add oxygen, you, you have a problem. Okay. But, and uh, so then, uh, with the... it, it's a discussion that's been going on a long time. And um, but what we've what we've developed now are weld procedures that generate the required fracture toughness and fatigue properties that we ah, need. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so so uh, what are the typical toughness values you get in, say, so, carbon, carbon manganese steel? Yeah, so, so what we're doing at the moment is we have a minus 40 Sharpie impact requirement. Okay. And we've been getting values of in excess of 100 joules at minus 40. Oh, that's, that's good. That's and we're also backing that up with SENT and SEMB fracture toughness testing. Okay. Uh, at, so, so actually, our, our our approach is to demonstrate fitness for service at the service temperature. So, so we're currently working at minus ten as a service temperature yeah. and achieving uh, CTOD values in excess of uh, one millimeter. Yeah, great. I think we have covered all the questions. Okay. Um, Chris, can I ask another question? There's quite a few in the chat. Should I look at those or is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can yeah. take that as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. There's a lot of people are just saying good evening and the, the pics are not visible. Which, there, are, there are a few. Yeah. How um, much vacuum required for welding? So, sorry, what was that one? How much vacuum is required for welding? Okay, so, so the vacuum, um, we can work at between one millibar, but... Uh, what one millibar is the sort of worst vacuum that we tend to work at. The ideal pressure is about two, two times 10 to the minus one. Okay. Um, we, we normally work just into the 10 to the minus two regime, but that, so what that gives you is two orders of magnitude uh, of headroom security, if anything goes wrong. So, okay. so one of the big benefits of working with this system is you can weld oily, dirty, pigeon covered components and that's something you can't do in a high vacuum system so you don't need to clean things quite so well right, right, right. and if there's a fault or a leak it doesn't stop the process working and there is one question what is the defect level acceptable in 65 mm thick weld joint uh, in, in in what thickness sorry 65 65 Oh, 65. So, yeah. so in terms of defect levels, we, we just work to the existing DMV code. So they're looking at three millimeter diameter uh, flat bottom hole reflectors for NDT. Uh, there's no crack-like or linear defects allowed, no lack of fusion. 
Um, the perhaps the biggest challenge is to get the well bead geometry acceptable. Yeah. And, we, and what we do there is grind it off. <laughs> <laughs> and then nobody argues about it. So, so the first thing everybody, all the inspectors say, that's no good. The well bead's got over penetration. Yeah. So we grind it off and say, what about now? And say, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, because the well bead is very narrow, it doesn't take much grinding. So before showing to the inspector, just grind off. Exactly, yeah. So, so, now, <laughs> so now we take the inspector for a cup of tea while we're doing a bit of grinding. And, uh, yeah. back so another one is, uh, how much is the heat input in vacuum laser welding? Uh, so heat input is a very interesting question because... It's not really the same as it is for arc welding. So, because all the all the heat, um, because everything's carried out in one pass, the, um, the 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 comparison of different heat heat inputs and kilojoules is not quite the same. So, what we tend to do is measure a cooling rate. We 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 state a cooling rate, and if you look at um, high heat input submerged arc welding you get a cooling rate of about 800 to 500 of 20 seconds. And it's, it's about the same. So it, it's, it's equivalent to high heat input submerged art welding. Okay. So, it, but it, we can't quote it as kilojoules per millimeter because it's, you can't compare the two numbers because of the way the process works. Um, yeah, Chris, now a couple of questions have got added in the Q and A. All right. Okay. So I think, uh, we can. We will take those two as well. Yeah. Um. So, so where are they? Oh yeah. Uh, Last. La yeah. So are you in? Uh, what is the heat input? Yeah. So the heat input is. Yeah. So the heat input is is kind of <coughs> a difficult thing to discuss, but it, the the overall heat input is is tiny compared to the other processes. So although it's the same cooling rate. You only do it in one pass. So if, if you look at the heat, the overall heat input in a, a 70 pass submerged art weld compared to an electron beam weld or laser weld, it's a lot lower. But the cooling rate per pass is about the same. So it's a question of it's the question about heat input or sort of metallurgical in, uh, impact of that. Uh, so you, your Jesh has said, are you in the process of developing the system so it'd be easily available to use? An industrial scale. The answer is yes. We we have systems now in industry, um, and it's we 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 have systems available now. If you if you wanted one for demonstration or or trial, and another question is: Have you done any CTOD testing during development, and what were the values at minus ten? Uh, so yes, is the short answer is yes. We have, and we have. Um, uh, satisfied the, the minimum requirements of DMBGL, which was 0 0.15 millimeter CTOD at minus 10. And we've also been looking at SENT testing, where we've got um, some very, very high values of CTOD. It's a, it's a good question, though, because that it does depend on which steel you're welding and, um, and, and the, the, the implications of that. Uh, so I think it's that all the Q and A. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you, Chris. I think we have taken uh, all the Q and A. Yeah, there's a few more in the chat. Um, one, one is about what is the uh, says which code is applicable for welder qualifies. Um, yes, I think you have already <laughs> covered that. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> what's the maximum high low? Uh, so we've looked at up to, with stainless steel. We've welded with eight millimeter high low in eighty. So we. We generally would say about 10% high-low is tolerable. Um, the structure we welded for the offshore wind structure is about three millimeter high-low in that. Uh, so it, it's quite good with high-low. It's not very good with gaps. That's the thing. We try to minimize okay. the gaps. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, wise man, you were asking something. Yeah. I. A kind of broader question. Um, so we're talking about energy transition, which is one of Chris's main roles now, and how to get people there. Um, one of the things in India and actually the UK, but differently, is innovation is going to be really piled on to the supply chain and 
SME community and stuff like that. Um, do you think this will remain a bit of a niche thing, Chris, or do you see it becoming a bit, you know, as many niche processes have over the years, becoming widely available and uh, something important is affordable? Uh, do you think yeah, that uh, kind of thing will go? Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, but it does, it depends on on, on how you measure um, cost <laughs> because uh, I'd, uh, I'd also be the first person to admit that all the existing art welding processes are, are very effective and very good at what they do. And this will by no means um, replace them or even replace a small fraction of them. So the, um, but, but there is a sort of potential cost benefit when you look at time and labor hours and all that kind of thing. And um, what, what you also realize is if somebody goes to, it's because it's welding, people are worried about cost. People will very happily go and buy a milling machine for uh, many millions of rupees. Yeah. And if somebody <laughs> says welding, it's, oh no, you don't need to spend money on that. It's, right. that that's cheap. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually you can save yourself. It, it, it's really how you assess the, the holistic saving. Uh, I mean, you can, you can say, oh, well, it's really quick, so it must save money, but actually that's just saving time. And you can say, oh, the consumables, you don't need consumables, so you save money. But actually, if you look at the whole, the whole process um, in terms of working hands, throughput, the effects of the energy consumption is something, I mean, energy is cheap, <laughs> but it's, it's not so cheap. Uh, and uh, I, but I think your point is is, is very good that in that it, it's not going to it's not going to overwhelm the industry, but there are some areas where it will show benefit. And okay, so my final my final little thing on that is with my kind of India hat on is yeah. um, India is really good at clusters, yeah, and shared kind of things. And I, I heard um, a foundry cluster down in Chennai um, for instance wanted green energy and uh, they basically club together is this the kind of process where small SMEs could maybe club together and, and get all get a use out of it yeah it, it I, sort of a, seems to me it, it maybe is absolutely and, and that's that's where that's where a, it's a really good way of applying the process is that you have a a consortium that all yeah. funds the because it's very fast, you say, well, blimey, if, if it takes 10 minutes to make a weld, what are we going to do for the rest of the day? And actually, <laughs> the, the, the answer to that is somebody else can use it for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Because yeah. You, and that's why you, you, you need enough product to make it worthwhile. <clears throat> um, but you, 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 you will all have seen factories where there's welding systems sat there doing nothing because the, the, the hard bit is getting all the bits ready for welding. And it's the same with electron beam. So if you've got a factory where everybody brings their stuff, or you take the machine to the factory and the machine is there for the use of many individuals or many companies. And, and that is a really, it's like a, an EB welding jobbing shop where you turn up and use it. Yeah, so correct. That's a really good idea. And that's, we for, for many years in the UK, we tried to do that. Mm. And uh, what you what you're struggling with is getting people to work together <laughs> yeah i think it's much more common and and likely in in india actually and yeah. it's the kind of thing that um R &D o and other kind of people who bring people together should be looking at uh, yeah with with people like irw i mean the reach is amazing mm. so that's yeah. why my my only contribution yeah no, i think it's a great contribution and yeah. it, i'd say a, a, a national facility yeah. where first of all people you could go along and try it you know, try it out get all your data and properties and then say right we'll buy one yeah because it's, yeah. it's, it's but but what you don't want to do is, is buy a machine uh use it a couple of times and say well actually you know submerge art welding is really good yeah. <laughs> yeah. thanks yeah. yeah. So uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Ashok Malke, the Secretary of Mumbai Branch, for the vote of thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Good so, evening, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to propose a vote of thanks 
I am Ashok Malage, Secretary, the Institute of Welding, Mumbai branch. The talk on local vacuum beam welding energy application by Ms. Chris Pushan was fantastic and very, very interesting. Because all these days we used to hear the conventional welding processes and applications. This is of a different nature altogether. The talk generated a lot of questions and uh, Chris clarified almost all. So on behalf of IW India Mumbai Bench, I thank Mr. Chris Postman for delivering an excellent talk. I also thank Chris Weissman and Ms. Shivasundaram for uh, active part for their active participation in the during the talk. Thanks to our technical team headed by Dr. Krishnan for organizing this excellent talk. Again, thanks to all the participants for their keen interest and being with us uh, till end and getting all the clarification required from the speaker. Thanks once one and all. Thank you, Chris Pushan, Sivasundaram, and Chris Weissman, and Dr. Krishnan, of course. Thank you. And thank yeah, you thanks. for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thank for you. both the Chris and Shiva. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll have a good evening yeah. and happy, see you soon. Oh, happy, happy Diwali. Yeah. Happy Diwali to you. Happy Diwali. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I'll go, I'll go for my lunch now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. See you soon. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.